You're listening to Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast, a clear voice in chaotic times. Our speaker, as has been mentioned, is Pastor Don Geiger. Pastor Geiger is a pastor to pastors. He currently serves as the senior pastor of the Redeemer Bible Church in East Dallas. Pastor Geiger first joined the Dallas Theological Seminary family as a student in the 1950s. And then again, when he became a member of the Seminary Board of Regents and the Board of Incorporate Members in October of 1981. Most of all, because of his love for the Lord and his love for serving his people, Pastor Geiger has served as a pastor for over 50 years. Now having pastored churches in Houston, Indianapolis, Dallas, prior to returning to Dallas, he served in Indianapolis, and when he got back to Dallas, he saw a need, and he proceeded to plant Redeemer Bible Church. He did it in the most ethical way possible in a region where he had formerly served, asking the churches who had been in that region or those churches that they had planted, would it be a possibility to have this kind of a ministry in this locality? And he came, received their blessing, was granted, and he has started a church and God is blessing. He did it in the best way. He and his wife Alice have been married for 49 years. They have four children and 10 grandchildren. This is church planting week, and I can think of few more qualified to address us today. Would you join me in welcoming our beloved Pastor Don Geiger. Thank you, Dr. Bailey. 20 years ago, Marine Corporal Zachary Mayo had eaten a large Thanksgiving dinner aboard the aircraft carrier America. He'd eaten too much. He was young and far from home, and he was a little homesick, so he couldn't sleep that night. About 3 o'clock in the morning, he strolled out on a catwalk of that great ship, six stories above the dark waters of the Indian Ocean, about 100 miles off the coast of Pakistan. As that carrier made a sweeping turn, a heavy steel door swung open knocked him overboard. He fell about 90 feet into the shark-infested waters of the Indian Ocean. He survived the fall, quickly realized there was nobody to hear his frantic cries for help, so his marine survival training kicked in. He slipped out of his coveralls, tied knots in the legs and the arms, and caught some air by swinging those coveralls over his head and rested on that makeshift life preserver which supported him very well for about two minutes. And then he took another swing, and a couple minutes later, another. That night, the swells were about five feet high. Sea creatures nipped at his body, including his face, all night long. Next day, swinging those coveralls, a shark kept circling him, and he'd pound the water with his fist and drive it away, only to have it come back. The second night, the swells were eight to 10 feet high, and he often found himself underwater, gasping and sputtering for air, wrestling with those coveralls. At about 30 hours, half delirious and totally exhausted, he fantasized that he was back home with his parents in Osborne, Idaho. Meanwhile, the casualty, Marine casualty officers, along with his pastor, had visited his parents and told him that he was lost at sea and presumed dead. After 36 hours, some Pakistani fishermen motored by, saw him, unwrapped their head turbans, and reached down and tied him around his arms and legs and hoisted him aboard. Later, Zachary figured he swung those coveralls about 5,000 times. He said, I had plenty of time to pray, pray, pray. Zachary Mayo is alive today because he persevered. Against all odds, he persevered. Somewhere in the depths of his being, he found the courage, the strength, to swing those coveralls one more time. God's word to you and me this morning is Hebrews 10, 36, the first four words. You don't even need to turn to it unless you want to. 
The text is, you need to persevere. I hope we'll all personalize that this morning and make that, I need to persevere. Against all the odds, swing those coveralls one more time. The Net Bible translates it well, and thanks men and women for the Net Bible. It reads, you need endurance to do God's will. But you knew that. But we all need the reminder. Some here this morning urgently need that word right now. The encouragement to hang in there, to persevere. Sooner or later, probably sooner, We'll all need that word. I need to persevere. So this morning in Peter's words, and I like the King James quaint quaint translation, I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. I was privileged to spend four years where you are, sitting out there studying at DTS, even more blessed to invest another 51 out there where by God's grace, You soon will be serving God with all your heart in the greatest cause and most fulfilling adventure you could possibly hope for. We're delighted you're preparing here, that you're in the pipeline and you'll soon be out there. Only God knows what you'll be doing and where, what he has in store for you. But I do know this. You will need to persevere. You need to persevere where you are, where you will be. It is an indispensable principle of life in general and ministry in particular. Now here, just a little bit of the context from Hebrews 10.35. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. This challenge to hang in there is immediately followed by chapter 11, that that great hall of the heroes of persevering faith. And as I mentioned just four of them, I want you to do a little instant recall and think about their lives, think about their perseverance and the consequences of their perseverance. Noah. Abraham, Joseph, Moses, who we read in verse 27, persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faithful perseverance, these men changed their world. As a matter of fact, they changed our world. Chapter 12 follows and describes us as being surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. And then it calls on us to run with perseverance, the race that God has marked out for us. And it's all there. It says, pick some examples to follow. Lighten your load. Always deal with sin in your life. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And then run your race and do it in his power. We're surrounded not only by these examples of perseverance, but by a host of others. New Testament, through the centuries, right here at Dow Seminary. We enjoy the blessings of Dow Seminary because men and women over these 82 years have persevered, including present company. Just just guesstimate how many years, how many hundreds of years are represented right here, years of perseverance. My goodness, just Dr. P and and Prof. (laughs) Hendricks alone represent over 100 years of perseverance. (laughs) That's not 100 years each, mind you. (laughs) Ask any of these men and women about the times in their lives or the lives of the seminary when they and others simply hung in there, persevered through difficult, dark times, just waiting for the sunrise. 
Psalm 30, verse 7 says, Weeping may endure for the night, and beloved, it often does. Do you know the next line? Yes, joy comes in the morning. The Bible is full of examples of endurance and encouragements to persevere. And track them down and learn from them. James 1.12 summarizes it pretty well. Blessed are the ones who persevere under trial. Because when they've stood the test, they'll receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Now, beloved, seminary and ministry is not all trial and testing and endurance. The privilege of studying God's word at DTS, then of spending your life sharing with others, that's glory. But that said, like every other vocation and calling in life, ministry calls for perseverance. You came to the greatest seminary, but not the easiest ones, and you know that. And now that God has called you here, he calls you to persevere in it. If he's called you to vocational Christian service, he's calling you and me and these others to, prefer, to persevere in it. But never forget, the call to persevere is God's word not only to us, but to everyone else as well. To those whom you will serve and to whom you will minister through the years. I believe God allows, maybe he even leads these erudite scholars sitting here, to overload you with work, not only because they truly believe that their course is the most important one in the seminary, but also to help you learn to persevere. I know your pain. Dr. Merrill Unger was my nemesis. <laughs> Godly man that he was, happy, brilliant, Old Testament Hebrew scholar. He never quite grasped the reality that some of us were ordinary mortals. <laughs> so we slightly redacted Psalm 3410 in his honor. If you remove a jot and add a tittle, here's what you get. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger. <laughs> he got a big kick out of that, but he never let up. So we clung for dear life to the next line. Do you know that one? But those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. And believe you me, a sea from hunger in Hebrew was a good thing in my book. <laughs> Having endured, persevered, you can sympathetically and honestly help others do the same. And beloved, that will be a large part of your ministry, any ministry. Philosopher poet Henry David Thoreau's most famous and perhaps truest line The mass of men live, lead lives of quiet desperation. One quickly learns in ministry that no one is exempt from the trials of life. No one. And those who have learned to persevere in their own trials are the best equipped to help others do the same as 2 Corinthians chapter 1 reminds us. There is a verb in the New Testament. It occurs six times, and always with the negative adverb, not. It is translated variously in the Net Bible. Do not lose heart. Don't become discouraged. Don't despair. Don't grow weary. That's the flip side of persevere. And each time it's used with regard to an area in life with a high potential for discouragement, even despair. And I mention them with the prayer that God will bring them to your mind and use them in your life as he has in mind time after time, just when you need them. We'll take them in the order they occur in the Bible. First and arguably most important, Luke 18.1. Then Jesus told them a parable to show that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. Out of sheer desperation, the widow in the story he then told persevered in her plea to the uncaring judge till she got her answer. We need to persevere in our prayer life. And some of us need that reminder this morning. The second one is found in 2 Corinthians 4.1. Therefore, since we have this ministry, 
just as God has shown us mercy, we do not become discouraged. Beloved, I'm here to tell you, ministry has its seasons. When not only does nothing good seem to happen, but bad things just seem to multiply. Everything moves at a snail's pace if it moves at all. And that's when we need to remember Spurgeon's reminder when he said, by perseverance, the snail reached the ark. I like that. <laughs> and it's true. Mother Teresa was once asked, do you ever get discouraged for lack of results as she would take in these dying people who were sick and starving and, and nurse them through their deaths? She said, God did not call me to succeed. He called me to serve the hurting. Mother Teresa had two requirements if you wanted to work with her. Willingness to work hard and a joyful attitude. And beloved, those two will take you far in ministry. The third use of our verb is also found in 2 Corinthians 4. As in chapter 11, Paul in chapter 4 gives us a rare glimpse of the pain and the struggles and the trials of his own life. In verse 8, he says, we are hard-pressed, like some of you right now. But he goes on, but not crushed. Perplexed. Who doesn't hit a brick wall from time to time and wonder where to turn? But he goes on, we're not in despair. Persecuted. Blessedly, that's not you and me now, but who knows? But not abandoned. Struck down but not destroyed. And then his punchline. This is one you need to memorize. Verse 16 of 2 Corinthians 4. Therefore we do not despair or lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. And here's the attitude. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Don't despair in the trials of life. The fourth use is found in Galatians 6, 9, where we read, so we must not grow weary, there's the verb, in doing good. For in due time, we'll reap if we don't give up. That little word good is is a special, rich word. It carries the overtones of of doing the lovely thing, the gracious thing, the kind and noble, the gentle thing. When Mary of Bethany anointed Jesus' head and feet with spikenard, that fragrant gesture, Jesus says, she's wrought a, a good work on me. She did the lovely thing. He said, I am the good shepherd, the kind and lovely. Don't grow weary in in the nice touch, the beautiful thing, the lovely thing. The fifth use is found in Ephesians 3.13, where Paul, from prison in difficult situations, I ask you not to lose heart, there's the verb, because of what I am suffering for you, which is for your glory. Often it's another's pain, another's suffering, another's trial that can be more difficult for us to bear than our own especially if it's our loved one. Every parent knows. When your child's suffering in a heartbeat, you would take his place, it's harder to see him or her suffer, or your spouse or a close friend or or those to whom you will minister. We need to persevere in suffering, in our own, in others. And the final use is found in 2 Thessalonians 3.13, where Paul writes, But you, brothers and sisters, do not grow weary in doing what is right. This one addresses our character. It calls us to perseverance in our integrity, our moral purity, our scrupulous honesty, our impeccable ethics. We need to persevere in prayer in ministry, through difficult times, 
our difficult times, others' difficult times, and in living according to Scripture. And in the grace and in the power of God, beloved, we can and we must. Bob Weiland was an all-conference high school athlete, showed great promise both for college and professional levels. He always wanted to run the New York City Marathon, and he did in 1986, and he finished dead last. He was the 19,413th runner to cross the line. His time, four days, two hours, 48 minutes, and 17 seconds. You see, Bob's legs were blown off in Vietnam when he stepped on a landmine while trying to rescue a buddy. He straps a, 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 a sort of saddle on his trunk and he runs with his arms. He said, my legs went flying in one direction. My life went flying in another. The good news is, yes, I might have lost my legs, but I didn't lose my heart. I do the best I can to apply the word of God to my life because I know it works. I really think God had a purpose in putting me in this situation so I can demonstrate to people that God, the God who dwells in me, can dwell in them. He also ran the Los Angeles Marathon. He did the Hawaii Ironman Triathlon in Hawaii. Get this. On September 8, 1982, he started walking, in quotes, uh, he started walking at Knott's Berry Farm in Orange County, California. And three years, eight months, six days, and 2,784 miles later, he arrived at the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C., in front of the name Jerome Lubineau, the man he tried to rescue when he got his legs blown off. Now that, beloved, is running with perseverance. Edwin Chapman, out of suffering have emerged the strongest souls, and the most massive characters are seamed with fire. Job, he knows the way that I take, and when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. And that can be, it must be, true of you and me as well. Stay in your race. Stand by your commitments. Finish what God has called on you to start. We need you. God needs you. Hang in there in the strength of our gracious triune God. I like the way Stu Weber brings it home in Tender Warrior. By the way, he promised me that if at least 30 of you will buy his book after I read this, he'll give us a dinner for two, Alice, so <laughs> dig out your wallets. No, nah, just kidding. Here's what he wrote. When marriage isn't fun, stay in it. When parenting is over your head, keep at it. When work, including homework, is crushing your spirit, don't let it beat you. When your church is overwhelmed with pettiness, stay by it. When your children let you down, pick them up. When your spouse goes through a six-month mood swing, live with it. When it's fourth and 14 and no more, almost no time left on the clock, throw another pass. I like that. And I would add, when you think you're about to go down for the last time, swing those coveralls one more time. 2 Corinthians 8.11. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to begin it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For years, I've often used an old Anglican benediction. It takes root in people's heart and helps them make it through the week. So go into the world in peace. Have courage. 
Hold on to what is good. Honor all men. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. And share the gospel. Love and serve the Lord in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And all God's persevering people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.